In this video, we'll cover data stream actions, or sometimes referred to as data streams. Data stream actions are extremely useful when our response data exceeds 10 megabytes or our third party system offers pagination for the response information. Consider the example where we want to get 10,000 records from our CRM. Sending a single request could either time out or return a response body so large that our instance may have issues processing it. Data stream actions have several benefits over simple actions. They allow you to parse a stream of response data greater than 10 megabytes. They automatically send multiple requests to APIs that paginate data. They allow flow designers to process large requests without complex coding or configuration. They simply use a for each loop and the data stream does the pagination automatically on the back end. Flow designers can also reuse data stream actions in multiple flows using the same data in different ways. Data stream actions can also be used in data sources and integration hub imports, which we'll demonstrate in upcoming videos. Now, as a side note, before we had data stream actions, I've built scripted outbound REST messages that did pagination, and it took much longer to build, much longer to debug, they didn't work in Flow Designer, and maintenance was well, let's just say it was much more time consuming. Okay, let's take a quick look at how to build, test, and use a data stream action. We're going to assume you've already created a scope and configured a connection and credential alias for this app. If you need more information on how to do this, see the links to earlier videos in this series in the description. Our use case is that we need to get an unspecified number of video records from YouTube. We're going to specify the playlist ID and our data stream is going to fetch all the information for each video in that playlist. We'll start by going into Flow Designer. And from the new button on the right, we'll choose Data Stream. Note the warning that data streams require an integration hub license. Talk to your account team if you don't have access to build a data stream. We'll give our action a name, add a playlist category since we plan to have more actions in this spoke and we want easy navigation then add a description. Pay close attention to the accessible from field. In almost every case, we want to set this to all application scopes. The rare exception to this might be a data stream action that is highly specialized and exclusive to the app or scope you're working on. Normally, we build spokes that are meant to be accessed from all other apps. Time to click Submit. Just like naming other actions, consider documenting a naming pattern standard for your custom actions. It makes sense to start with a verb, get, update, move, and so on. We can always look at ServiceNow provided actions for ideas. To help identify this as a data source and not a regular REST action, we might like to put a DS suffix. Here we see the action designer. If you've built custom actions before, you may notice the action outline on the left is a bit different. This helps guide us through the data stream building process. Let's take a look. As with most other actions, we'll define our inputs. In this case, we'll accept a playlist ID as a string input and make it mandatory. Let's look under action processing. We see that there's only a single checkbox and description. When we check the checkbox, it automatically adds a step to the action outline where we can add some code that runs once at the beginning of our action. This may be used to prepare the request payload, validate inputs, or any number of initial setup tasks. We're not going to use a pre-processing script here, so let's turn it off and move on to the request section. Here we're given some simple configuration options. We'll start by choosing the appropriate method for retrieving our data, in this case, REST step. Configuring any of the other types follows a similar process going forward. We'll acknowledge the warning and move on. We also have the option to enable pagination. From reading the docs, we know that our YouTube API has pagination available, so we'll check that box. Note that both of these configuration options are automatically updating the action outline to the left. In our case, we don't need to run a script before each request, but if we did, we could check this box and configure the added script step. Okay, let's take a look at the pagination setup step closer. Pagination is typically done in one of two ways, although you may encounter others. The first is a limit offset method, or sometimes called a start count or start stop method. This method uses query parameters to tell the API what record number to start with and how many records to retrieve. 
For example, the first request might say, start at zero and get 20 records. The next request would say, start at 20 and get 20 records, and so on until all the records are retrieved, at which point the get next page variable would be set to false. If you like, you can save some time building your pagination script by clicking this button and using a template. Note that the script may require some testing and modifications, but it helps to speed things up. The other common method of pagination is to embed a token in the response body. This is how our data stream is going to retrieve pages of information from YouTube. We know this from the documentation. If there's no token, there's no next page. From the docs or a test response body, we see that the token is called next page token. So we'll set a variable here with that name. We'll indicate it comes from the response body. It's in JSON and we'll use this notation in the expression field to tell the system where to find the token in the response body. In this case, dollar sign represents the root level and next page token, if present, is a first level property. We'll create our pagination setup script to set the get next page variable to true if our page token exists and false if it doesn't. That was pretty simple. Of all the places to configure the data stream action, I find this is where I spend the most time. It's not uncommon to only get one page when you expect more or to get the same page over and over again. That tells us that our pagination isn't configured correctly. Now let's configure the rest step. If you've watched the video in this series about creating a custom integration hub action, this should look familiar. We'll use our predefined connection alias to get our base URL and connection, indicate which resource we want, validate its get method, and specify the query parameters as either hard-coded strings, like the part and max results parameters, or dynamically, like the playlist ID, key, and page token. We'll add the accept header. We now need to tell the system what to do with the response body it received. This is typically going to include an array of objects representing the records and fields. This is where the parsing section of the action outline comes in. The first question is pretty easy since it only has one answer. We'll be identifying each record using the JSON XML splitter. Choosing that makes the splitter step appear in our outline. The second question is equally impressive we're going to use the script parser. And as expected, the script parser step appears. Let's go take a look at the splitter step first. In our case, since we asked for JSON with the accept header, we choose JSON as the source format. Again, referring to our test response, we can see that our array of records is referenced from the top level of our JSON object as items. So we'll use this notation again. Be sure to watch for typos. Now let's take a look at the script parser step. There's a good amount of comments to help us write this script. Referencing the JSON example, we see that we first need to parse the inputs.source item. This represents one individual item returned from our array. We can either pass this item back through outputs.target object directly or assign individual values to individual properties. For this example, Let's do that since the source item is fairly complex. We're also going to watch for errors parsing. If we encounter any, we can tell the parser to skip this record and move on to the next, rather than have the action crash with an error. Like any other action, we'll map our outputs. In the case of data stream actions, we create an object that maps to the same structure as in the script parser step. We'll create a video object and the three fields we assigned to outputs.target object in the parser step earlier. Let's save and give it a test. Note the message that this test only retrieves the first 20 records. Now let's take a look at the execution details. The runtime value for the output data looks great. If our output data has a lot of details, long descriptions, or something else that makes these 20 records very large, we may not see the data represented in this JSON format, or it may be truncated. If that happens, we can adjust the global system property seen here. This property defaults to 16384 bytes, or 16K. We can try setting the value higher in increments of 16K until we see the output rendered properly. Just note, the larger the value, 
the more work the system has to do to serialize the output. Also note, this is a global system property and impacts more than just our data stream action. We should work with our system administrator closely when changing global system properties. Of course, as we saw before, this only got the first 20 records and we want to test the pagination. So let's save and publish our work and create a new flow to test it. Let's say we want our flow to run every morning at 2 a.m. to refresh our table of videos. We'll then go to the Actions menu and select our new data stream action. We'll provide the playlist ID and click Done. Notice that the data stream action is automatically a for each construct. The system is just going to keep providing us a record until they're all out. It automatically gets another page of records as needed without any intervention at the flow designer level. This makes it really easy for our flow designer users to consume data stream actions. Inside the for each loop, Let's create or update a record using the data pills from the data stream action. We'll use the video ID to determine uniqueness and populate the title and channel ID fields. That's it. Everything from our integration behaves like anything else in Flow Designer. For the sake of time in this video, we won't run the flow, but this is where we would test our pagination as well. If we don't get all the records created in the target table, then it's time to look at pagination. Data stream actions are very powerful and easy to use. They don't take long to build and are easier to maintain than their scripted counterparts. In upcoming videos, we'll see a couple of other ways you can leverage the power of data stream actions in the platform.